I've already preached them, and they preach well. <laughs> Thank you. When I hear a shot, I don't duck anymore, because I've been told to expect one any time nowadays. But I want to take an old, obscure sermon that Moody preached, and I don't know where it's found, but I think it was in one of Wilbur Smith's books on Moody that this sermon was found, and I made notes from it and made my own little outline and preached it one time years ago in North Carolina. And before I read it, I want to say that I'm the most unworthy person to be here. In fact, uh, one of the times that I'm nervous and perspiration in the palms of my hand is right now. I remember the first sermon I ever preached was in North Florida, and I had prepared four sermon outlines, and each one I thought could last 45 minutes, and I was asked at this little Baptist church on a cold February night, and there were 36 people present, and I got up, and I preached all four sermons in eight minutes. <laughs> and I could possibly do the same today. Because on the 100th anniversary of the man in evangelism that I have admired the most and patterned a great deal of our evangelistic work after, I could never believe that I would have that great honor and that great privilege. And uh, I, I feel terribly honored and humbled to be invited here today. Yes, it was five years ago that Dr. Sweeting wrote to me and asked me. I'd never had anybody write me that long ahead. And I accepted. I expect if he'd have waited a little while longer, he might not have invited me. But being that far back, uh, he invited me. And secondly, I accepted because I considered it one of the greatest privileges of my entire life is to be invited to this service here. The last time that I preached at Founders Week, I can remember at the Moody Church, and I remember what I preached on. I preached on hell. I never got an invitation back. <laughs> Not because of that, but I think that they thought that I'd taken too much material from R.A. Tari because he preached on hell a great deal. Moody did not preach on hell much but R.A. Torrey did. And I believe that it needs to be re-emphasized again today because people today do not have an understanding of what eternity is and there's a heaven and a hell and what men decide about Christ is where they're going to go. And this text is found in Deuteronomy, the 32nd chapter and the 31st verse. For their rock is not our rock, for their rock is not our rock. And then switching over to the seventh chapter of Matthew, beginning with verse 12, oh, pardon me, for verse uh, 21, these words, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not preached in your name? Have we not cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I know you not. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon the house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the wind blew, and beat upon the house, and it fell, and great was the fall thereof. There have been only a relatively few men in the history of the church that has had such a profound impact as Dwight L. Moody. Directly, he touched thousands in his day. Indirectly, through all the things that he started, he's touched millions. 
His example and his single-minded zeal to preach the gospel have influenced my own life tremendously. As a matter of fact, the little town that I live in is Montreat, North Carolina. That town was founded by D.L. Moody. He sent two people down from Northfield to find a conference center in the South that would be suitable for conferences, and they founded that little valley, which was called the Mountain Retreat Association. It became Presbyterian, and Wilbur Chapman lived there. And that's where we live, and Moody had a part in that. There have been few institutions in the history of the church which have so broadly touched the world for Christ as the Moody Bible Institute during these past hundred years. It has been my privilege now to preach the gospel in 62 countries on every continent, and virtually everywhere we've gone, we found alumni of the Moody Bible Institute proclaiming the gospel and working for the gospel in all those places. Toward the end of his life, Moody said, I've started some streams which will flow into eternity. And look at the streams he started. Certainly the work of the Moody Bible Institute has produced results in abundance which will flow on into eternity. It is an eloquent testimony to your commitment to world evangelization that one out of every 15 Protestant missionaries from North America are graduates of the Moody Bible Institute. Over 70 percent of the pilots serving on the mission field are graduates of Moody's aviation program, which is just across the mountain from where my son lives, who is in full-time Christian work, and he has his airplane, and he flies it over there to get it fixed from time to time. And every four minutes, somewhere in the world, a Moody-trained missionary pilot is taking off. Every day, a half million people see one of your science films, and millions read the books and the literature, and hundreds of thousands read the Moody Monthly and listen to the radio programs produced at Moody. Many of the greatest missionary and evangelistic outreaches of this generation were founded by people who studied at Moody. And I could go on and on, for God has greatly blessed and used this institution during a hundred years. Several members of my own team are graduates of Moody. In thinking about what I should say today, I thought of this rather obscure passage that I had preached years ago, not knowing quite where I found it. For their rock is not our rock. And Jesus, I'm sure, had this passage in mind when he spoke the words of the second text from Matthew that I read. And as we think of the last hundred years of the Moody Bible Institute, we cannot help but ask, why, why, why has God blessed it and used it so greatly? And how could it apply to your life here today? I think part of the answer lies in the Board of Trustees through these years and the six presidents that Moody has had. It's quite remarkable that there's only been six presidents in a in hundred years. D.L. Moody, R.A. Tari, James Gray, Will Houghton, William Culbertson, and George Sweeting. God has used the Moody Bible Institute because it has always sought to build its ministry upon the rock of God's truth. It is sought above all to be faithful to the Word of God, and God has rewarded that faithfulness. And in an age which we have seen powerful ways of secularization engulf most educational institutions, Moody Bible Institute has been willing to go against the trend and remain faithful to its original vision. It said with Moses, for their rock is not our rock. These words were spoken by Moses in his farewell address to the people of Israel. He had been their leader for 40 years, and he had been with them day and night. He had shared their burdens, lifted their vision, ached when they turned away from God from time to time. He had been their king, their president, their judge, their father, all wrapped in one. Now he's an old man getting ready to depart for heaven, and the people are going to go into the promised land. Only two people will go in with them that had started. Joshua and Caleb, and now with his long white hair and his long white beard, he reminds them of God's faithfulness of the past, and then he warns them of nations round about 
who did not believe in a living God. And he warned the people within Israel who had strayed from God's path, and he warned the judgment would come. He said, their rock, their foundation, these nations round about you, their rocks, their foundations are not your ways. The places and ways they look for stability and security are not yours. The way they live and the goals they have are not yours. You have a different rock, a different set of values, a different set of ethics, a different message. Let's look at some of the rocks which people build their lives today. In Moses' time, as in the times of Jesus and today, people build their lives on different rocks. Some of them look very attractive and stable, but they're not. Jesus' parable at the end of the Sermon on the Mount warned that those foundations will wash away when the storms of life come. The foundations will be destroyed. What are some of these rocks? Well, first, there's materialism. There are people today that think if they only had more money, more income. And by the way, being debt-free a hundred years, I wish that the Board of Trustees of Moody Bible Institute had been running this country. And I'll bet President Reagan wishes it too. In Deuteronomy 32, we read that Jeshurun had waxed fat, and he was covered with fatness. He forsook God, which made him, and he lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. Many people are under the impression that more money, if I can just live on a higher standard of living, I'll be happy. I have been, we have been in places where the average income was $300 a year. In Bangladesh, $150 a year. And we've seen people who lived under those conditions found a happiness and a peace and a joy in Christ. That people that live on millionaires row would give anything in the world to find. Some of the most miserable people I've ever met are wealthy people. Film stars in Suffolk go to Beverly Hills. They have more psychiatrists in Beverly Hills than any other place in the whole world. And yet it has the highest standard of living in America. Many people are under the impression if they could just get more, that would take care of their longings and needs. Just a few weeks ago, a poll was taken in the country asking people if your office had a copy machine that would copy money and it wouldn't look counterfeit, would you use it? 20% of the American people said yes. Jesus said you cannot serve God and mammon. Man's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesseth, he said. A famous man said not long ago, I'm worth millions, and I can tell you, money is not where it's at. Adolf Burl, in his study of power, points out that riches make people solitary, lonely, and afraid. And one of the great things about Dwight L. Moody was he never had a love for money. He had a number of wealthy friends, both here in Chicago and Philadelphia and New York and London. And Moody could have been a wealthy man. But R.A. Torre said about him, money had no charms for him. He loved to gather money for God's work. He refused to accumulate money for himself. He would have loved the way the collection was taken today because Moody didn't mind asking people for money. Now, Hudson Taylor did. George Mueller did. Some of these other great men did, but Moody would look him right in the eye and say, look here, you've promised $5,000, make it 10. If he said 10, he said, make it 20. He'd ask people for a half million dollars. He didn't mind that. God had given him that gift of faith to believe. Somebody said, well, George Mueller lived by faith, and he never asked people for money. Moody said, you show me a man with $10,000 for God, and I've got faith enough to ask him for it. But he never let any stick to his fingers. A biographer wrote that millions passed through his hands, but he never kept it for himself. And the love of money has been the ruination of many a Christian believer. And then secondly, people are building their lives on the rock of selfish pleasure. We're a satiated society looking for new kinds of new thrills, 
sex and violence fill our television screens. Billions of dollars of drugs are used by old and young alike to take trips that often destroy the mind and the body. John Belushi was born and reared out here at Wheaton. And before his tragic death at 33, he's quoted as having asked his psychoanalyst, why is it that I give so much pleasure to the world through Saturday Night Live and all the films I've acted in, yet I have so little pleasure myself? Sexual deviation has become a, new, a way of life as it was in ancient Greece and Rome, and it's being presented to us as an alternate lifestyle. And what a price we're already beginning to pay for it. It may be the biggest problem and the greatest plague that our nation has ever known. Our world seems to be on a wild roller coaster slide, frantically seeking new pleasures. But King Solomon tried them all. He tried education, he tried money, he tried the whole works. And at the end, he said, I've said to my heart, go to now. I will prove thee with mirth. Therefore, enjoy pleasure, and behold, this also was vanity. At the end of each one of those, he said, it's all vanity. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. I've learned that none, none of these things satisfy. Only God satisfies. Only Christ can give us the lasting happiness and true pleasure. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. When troubles come, or you stare death in the face, the rock of pleasure turns out to be sand. Someone asked me at one of the universities. I spend a great deal of time at universities, and we have questions and answer periods. And they asked me, they said, at your age, I guess they thought I was a real old man, they said, at your age, what is the greatest surprise in your life? I said, the greatest surprise of life to me at my age is the brevity of life. How quick it's all over. And then there's the rock of false religiosity. Jesus said, this people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart are far from me. There are many people that think that they can do good, do good, and good works are going to save them. We're saved by grace, through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So many famous people, especially in the jet set, socialites, give charity balls and charity events. And one of the most prominent of these ladies said to me, Certainly God will count this toward me getting into heaven. And I replied, no, ma'am. You could give a million of these affairs and it wouldn't get you one glimpse into heaven. And she looked at me very startled. She said, well, what is the gospel all about then? I said, the gospel is all about Jesus Christ dying on the cross and shedding his blood and rising from the dead and re the, us repenting of our sins and receiving him as savior. And I said, there's nothing you can do about it. You could give all the charity balls and give all your money, but that's not going to save your soul. A few months ago, when that volcano blew the top in Colombia and the waves of mud engulfed whole towns, killing 22,000 people, those who were saved were those who were able to lodge themselves on the high rocks until they could be rescued. And as the mud flows of modern society, threatened to devour us, we need, in the words of the old song, to flee to the rock that is higher than I. There are warning signals all about us today. Anybody that's ever been briefed by the Pentagon, anybody that's been briefed in the Soviet Union and seen them put before you all the weapons that we have and they have that could destroy the world 18 times over, Remember the words of President Kennedy nearly a quarter of a century ago. He said, each day the crisis multiplies. Each day their solution grows more difficult. Each day we draw nearer the hour of maximum danger, and time has not been our friend. President Kennedy was speaking prophetically. Time has not been our friend. There's a little glimmer of hope at the moment in the world a little sigh of relief when Mr. Gorbachev and Mr. Reagan met and talked and seemed to get along in their private sessions. 
there's a little glimmer of hope out of Geneva. But when we know what man's heart is, I'm not so sure that the Soviet Union and the United States will ever go to war, but what about those 15 other little countries that have got the atomic bomb? One of them with their backs to the wall could start a chain reaction that could destroy a great deal of the human race. They're not going to destroy the whole human race in an atomic war because God has another plan. And God's plan is that when man stands at Armageddon ready to destroy himself, Christ is going to come back. He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. But whether we like it or not, we're engaged in warfare right now. There's a terrorist war that we do not know how to handle. I was talking day before yesterday to Bill Webster, who's chair, head of the FBI, and he wanted to see me then. And I said, well, I have to be gone a couple weeks, but as soon as I come back, I'll come to Washington to see you. And I knew what he wanted to talk about because it already called about it. If there was ever a time that we needed to flee to the rock that is higher than I it is now, and the history of the Moody Bible Institute points us to the rocks that will stand and on which we should build our lives. What are the rocks that we should build? Throughout its century of ministry, the Moody Bible Institute has built its foundation on different rocks from the rocks of the world and pointed its students to build their lives on different rocks. Their rock is not our rock. What are these rocks? A rock of unchanging strength like Gibraltar or the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem or El Capitan at Yosemite. First, there's the rock of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Ephesians 2.20, Paul said, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. 1 Corinthians 3.11, the apostle Paul said, for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid in Jesus Christ. Across the decades, Moody Bible Institute has sought to exalt Christ. Moody Bible Institute's second president was R.A. Torrey, one of Moody's close associates, a brilliant graduate of Yale. He did postgraduate studies in Germany, where he found himself surrounded by higher critics who scorned the Bible and its teachings. It was a time of tremendous struggle for him, but eventually he gave his life without reserve to Christ. In addition to being the second president of the Moody Bible Institute, Torrey conducted huge evangelistic campaigns around the world in the first decade of this century. And whether in Sydney, London, Glasgow, Belfast, or Toronto, last week I had the privilege of preaching the funeral service of Dr. Oswald J. Smith. And he was converted under R.A. Torrey, who was preaching at Massey Hall in Toronto. And I thought about this text. Isaiah 32, 2, the favorite text of R.A. Torrey. And a man shall be as a hiding place from the wind, and as the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. And Torrey would thunder time after time, that man, that great rock in a weary land is the Lord Jesus Christ. That was the rock that D.L. Moody had established. It is the rock that all succeeding leaders of this institution have continued to build on. I have been thrilled at the progress of this institution under the leadership of Dr. George Sweetie, how he too had an evangelistic background and he has kept a steady course and built on that rock all of these things that Moody stood for. And I thank God today that Moody is still there and making progress and Moody would be thrilled today. There have been many storms that have battered, but the institution stands stronger than ever because it stands on the rock. Secondly, there's the rock of the Bible, the Word of God. We are living in a period when there's a great discussion going on once again, just like it did in the latter part of the last century and the early part of this century, and we thought perhaps the battle was over, but no, it's flared up again in the newspapers, in the magazines, whether the Word of God is infallible. D.L. Moody had a simple childlike faith in the Bible as the inspired, infallible Word of God. He was not a student of psychology. He was not a student of the sciences. Many of the words that we take for granted today, even in theology, he would not have had the slightest idea of what they meant. 
As Torrey said, he was a profound and practical student of one book, and that was worth studying more than all the other books in the world together, and that book was the Bible. Moody used to rise at 4 o'clock in the morning to study the Bible. He said, if I'm going to get in any study, I've got to get up before the other folks get up. And most of us merely play at Bible study. Moody took it seriously. How many of us cut off the TV to study the Word of God? It was largely because of his tremendous knowledge of the Bible and his practical application of the Bible that Moody drew such immense crowds. People are hungry for the Word of God. I found that in my small way throughout the world, in Eastern Europe especially. We've been to all those countries in Eastern Europe except Bulgaria, and we're going there probably next year. And here in October, we saw 20 and 30,000 people a night in Romania jamming the streets with their tape recorders and everything to hear the Word of God. And they're hungry for Bibles. They don't want books about the Bible, they want the Bible. And I find in our generation that people are hungry for God's Word. They're not interested in what we have to say about so many other things. And in Moody's day, as in our day, there have been massive attacks on the authority and inspiration of the Bible as the infallible Word of God. But beyond question, one of the Moody Bible Institute's secrets is that it has never wavered in its conviction that the Bible is the inspired Word of the living God, and the Bible alone is God's infallible Word. Moody's great assistant, Ira Sankey, once said, one of the reasons for Moody's phenomenal success in bringing souls to God was that he believed absolutely implicitly in the message that he preached. His faith was the faith of a little child. No doubts ever dimmed his faith in the Word of God. To him, it was the truth and the whole truth. God has promised, my word shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. During the years when radical theology seemed to be predominant in this country, the Moody Bible Institute stood like a rock of Gibraltar on the Word of God. It became a lighthouse to which Christians looked throughout the world for guidance and leadership. Thirdly, there's the rock of prayer. Moody was a man of prayer, not pompous, not to impress others, but it flowed from a close and intimate daily walk with Christ. When Oswald Smith prayed, and he was a great man of prayer, he paced back and forth. I do that a lot, and I wondered if I ever sacrilegious or wrong. There's no certain position in the Bible where you're to be when you pray. I find myself praying all the time, instant in season, out of season. My subconscious is praying now, Lord, help me to say the right thing to these people, because there's some people here today, I believe, and I've felt it since a little while ago, there's some people here that do not really know Christ. You know about him, you may be a professing believer, but deep in your heart you're not sure. And there's some people here today that need to rededicate their lives to Christ and rededicate yourself to the principles for which this institution stands and the rocks upon which it stands. As one of Moody's friends said concerning him out of a very intimate acquaintance with him, I wish to testify that he was a far greater prayer than he was a preacher. Time after time, he confronted problems that seemingly had no solution. He didn't know where to turn. He turned to God in prayer, and God answered his prayer. My first time to visit the Moody Bible Institute was in 1940 when I came to school at Wheaton. I came here. My mother had wanted me to come to the Moody Bible Institute. And I could sense and feel God's presence in those halls, just walking through the hall. And in 1943, I came here. I was pastor of a little church in Western Springs, and I came in here to steal one of your men. And over a period of two years, I was successful. George Beverly Shea came with me. Not for more money. I don't know why he came except God sent him. And then about a few weeks later came George Bev uh, came Cliff Barrows. 
and T.W. Wilson and Grady Wilson were already with me. So we've been together all these years, and God has honored it and blessed it, and part of it came from the Moody Bible Institute. The Bible says, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Now, I do not mean that God's going to honor your stealing. Don't get me wrong. I didn't mean steal. I meant to borrow. <laughs> Is there a failure in your prayer life? There's a failure in my prayer life. I sense it all the time. There's a failure in my study of the Word of God. Someone asked me at a, at a seminary, if I had it to do over again, what would I change? I said I would study more and pray more and preach less because I believe that has been one of the great failures and mistakes of my life. If I, I'll have to wait till the judgment seat of Christ to find out, but I'm sure that that's true. Someone has said if there's any tears in heaven, it'll be over the fact that we prayed so little. Someone else has said that heaven is filled with answers to prayer for which no one ever bothered to ask. Moody Bible Institute has been built on the rock of prayer. And fourthly, then there's the rock of the Spirit-filled life. Moody had been filled with the Holy Spirit and his life showed it. If ever a man had the fruit of the Spirit produced in his life by the Holy Spirit, it was Moody. Some years ago, I heard of one great clergyman who said concerning another, both of them are now in heaven, I wouldn't tell it. This one preacher said, that other clergyman is a fine preacher when he gets in the pulpit, but in his personal life, he has everything but love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, and temperance. And if we don't have that, we don't have anything. You can be a great preacher and not produce the fruit of the Spirit or the Holy Spirit producing it through you and in you, and you're nothing but sounding brass and tinkling cymbal. Our lives must match our lips. The Apostle Paul said, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Moody lived in the Spirit, he walked in the Spirit. Fifthly, then there's been the rock of a missionary vision. Moody had a consuming passion. Soon after his conversion to win people to Christ, he made a resolution that he would never spend 24 hours without speaking to someone about their faith in Christ. Moody's personal commitment to winning people, not only here at home but throughout the world, has been one of the rocks on which this institution has been born. In America, the YMCA would have never got off the ground had it not been for Moody. Many of the great evangelical movements of our day came from Moody because of his tremendous vision. And when he sat down and talked to the people here in Chicago, and some of them had a burden for a Bible school here, he joined right in. And he said, I have a burden for the people of all the world, not just America, but the whole world. And it's difficult for us to envision and to grasp what Moody started in his conferences at Mount Hermon. Someone has called him the grandfather of the ecumenical movement, but Moody never dreamed which way it was going to go. He never saw it come into existence. But he started all of these tributaries that have flowed out in different directions. Certainly, he would be proud today of that part of his ministry that stands called the Moody Bible Institute. Moody never preached a social gospel sermon in his life. But his ministry led to some of the great social movements of our time. For example, Care Hardy, I was telling the press about. The founder of the British Labour Party was influenced by Moody. He went to Mr. Moody and he said, what can I do for God? And Moody said, help the laboring people of Scotland. Care Hardy became an evangelist all of his life. But he also founded the British Labour Party to help the laboring people of that day who were in such dire straits. We could go on and on about the great social movements that he began. His influence on the royal family of England when Princess Alexandra came to receive Christ as Savior in one of his meetings, and she was the Princess of Wales. 
and influenced the royal family down to the present royal family. His great passion for souls and his passion for missions gathered momentum toward the end of his life, and that was the passion that helped him start the Moody Bible Institute. For the first time in the history of the human race, you and I have the technology to reach the whole world with the message of Christ. Jesus said that one of the signs that would appear before his return would be, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, then shall the end come. And it's significant that Jesus began his final commission to his disciples with these words, all power is given unto me, both in heaven and on earth. How dare we disobey the command of our sovereign Lord to go ye into all the world and teach all nations. One of the great missions that Moody held was at Cambridge University. It's been my privilege to hold two eight-day missions at Cambridge University, one year before last. And I sympathize with what he went through, especially in the early days of the mission. They laughed and sneered and made fun. But in the second half of the mission, things turned around. Hundreds of students began to come to hear him. Other hundreds received Christ. And one of his, at, out of his mission at Cambridge came the famous Cambridge Seven. And one of those whom you've heard about many times was C.T. Studd. He was captain of the prestigious Cambridge University cricket team and the son of a wealthy man. But he sensed the claim of Christ on his life and he offered himself for missionary service in China. At the age of 25, he inherited a fortune from his father's estate. He gave it all away to Christian work. At the age of 50 and in poor health, after missionary service in China and India, he felt that God had called him to take the gospel also to Africa, and he prepared to leave for Africa. And he wrote this, quote, Last June, at the mouth of the Congo, there awaited a thousand prospectors, traders, merchants and gold seekers waiting to rush into the regions as soon as the government opened the door to them. For rumor declared that there's much gold in the Congo. If such men, Stud said, hear so loudly the call of gold and obey it, can it be that the ears of Christ's soldiers are deaf to the call of God and the cries of the dying souls of men? Are gamblers for gold so many and gamblers for God so few? Today, I'm asking you, will you rededicate your life on this 100th anniversary of the Moody Bible Institute to stand on the rock on which Moody stood 100 years ago? Not on the sinking sands, but on the rocks that we've mentioned here today. There's another rock, the rock of the second coming of Christ. Moody believed it, and he preached it. And when the Jesus was ascending into heaven, and those two men stood in white apparel, and the disciples had tears coming down their cheeks because their master and their Lord was leaving. They said, why are you weeping? Why do you stand gazing into heaven? This same Jesus shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. And they went out, filled with the Holy Spirit after Pentecost, and preach the resurrection and the coming again of Christ. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground all other ground is sinking sand. And when he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid ground I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Do you stand on the rock? Or do you stand on the sand? When the storms of life come, the disappointments come, death comes, 
Are you ready? Are you sure? Are you certain? If you have a doubt in your heart this day that you know Christ, you really know him, that you have repented of your sins and received him into your heart by faith, and you want to make sure and you want to be certain, I want you to be sure. After the service is over, there are going to be some people down here that would be glad to talk with you. And then I'm going to ask all of us that God has spoken to today, and you say, I want to rededicate myself to the rocks upon which the Moody Bible Institute was founded, or I want to receive Christ into my heart as Lord and Master and Savior. Or I am away from God, and I want to come back to him. I want you to stand up where you are as an act of rededication or receiving Christ. I'm sure that many of you have done it already this week, but you stand. Because I'm standing, and I mean it, I want to rededicate my life to these rocks upon which Moody built this institution. Dr. Sweeting is going to lead us in prayer.